Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. And uh, welcome to our second episode of uh, Secrets of the Seabed. Uh, this webinar series um, is uh, part of the EU Life Remedies project, uh, which is looking to uh, work with um, seabed habitats uh, to, to better protect them, to really uh, look after them. So uh, throughout this webinar, uh, you're going to hear from a series of wonderful people who I'll introduce to you in just a moment. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see them in a minute. They'll, they'll turn their videos on and we can, we can see their, their wonderful faces uh, and we will be able to um, hear from them throughout this webinar on the topic. What is so special about these areas of conservation? Uh, now special areas of conservation uh, are um, is a topic that of our first speaker, so I won't go into too much detail about what they are, but uh, the Life Recreation Remedies uh, Project is looking at five uh, special areas of conservation throughout the south of England. Um, various habitats on the seabed within these areas uh, are in unfavourable condition, and the aim of this project is to move them into favourable condition through a, a number of different inputs uh, which the, the project is working on. Uh, so we are going to look at those topics today. Um, and to do so, uh, we're going to go through a webinar which is going to be about half an hour long um, for, for speaking and then an extra sort of 10-15 minutes uh, for any questions uh, that you guys uh, may have in the audience. Um, now, if you do have questions throughout our webinar today, uh, we do have a chat function, uh, which is at the bottom of your, your screen there. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, you also have a question and answer box as well. Uh, so the chat is really useful if, if we uh, say something you want to respond to, if we ask a question and you want to respond to that, uh, please put the answer in the chat. If you have a question that you'd like us to get to at the end of the session, uh, please pop that in the question and answer box. Uh, and we'll do our very best to answer all those questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, so we are going to get going with our first speaker really soon. Um, we do want to let you know just at the top of your screens you'll also have um, a, a section that's a, a little option that says view. If for any reason you can't see a presentation or you can't see one of our speakers and you want to change the way you view your screen, uh, click on that one up there and you should have a number of options of different ways to view your screen. Uh, we're all pretty Zoom savvy at this point uh, in, in time, but if anyone's a bit unsure, uh, that's where your option is uh, to change uh, your view uh, of the screen. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, we have uh, three wonderful speakers today. Uh, we have Fiona Crouch, uh, who works for Natural England as the project manager for EU Life Remedies. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about special areas of conservation, uh, what they are, uh, and a little bit of background to them. Uh, we have Tim Ferreira, who works for Hampshire and um, Isle of Wight uh, Wildlife Trust. Uh, he's going to talk to us about that wonderful area around the Solent, uh, lovely lovely beautiful place um, and we have Gina Wright who also works for Natural England as marine uh, lead uh, site lead for, for Essex uh, another beautiful part of our country so these guys are going to talk in in turn uh, on their on their topics so uh, I'm going to hand over to Fiona to, to kick us off now uh, so enjoy uh, and uh, we'll we'll catch up with your questions at the end. Okay, uh, thank you, love day. Um, yes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to be speaking to you a little bit about how special areas of conservation came about, um, maybe some of the key issues around um, those habitats within the SACs, um, and then a little bit about what we're trying to do with remedies, um, and then I'll be passing you um, over to Tim. Okay, so special areas of conservation. Um, they were established under the EU Habitats Directive all the way back in 1992. And the reason for designating these um, SACs was to ensure the conservation of a wide range of rare, threatened or endemic animal and plant species, plus another um, 200 um, rare and uh, characteristic habitats. So the SACs were to promote the maintenance and biodiversity of um, our areas, taking account economic, social, cultural and regional requirements. 
And then along with the um, SACs, there was another European directive, which was a uh, directive for the birds, for protection of birds. And they, produced, they came about with their special um, protection areas. And between the SACs, acronym nightmares, um, and SBAs, um, uh, through these European directives was to establish an EU-wide Natura 2000 ecological network of protected areas. So these are habitats and species land see um, across the areas and in the UK, see from the map, we have 39 uh, marine special areas of conservation. And there are a number of habitats, so um, annexes, sorry, Annex 1 and Annex 2, so Annex 1 are habitats and Annex 2 are species. Uh, now, uh, I can probably hear you saying, but what about Brexit? We are no longer in the EU, so what happens to all these directives? Um, well, when we were, um, decided we were leaving, um, a team in DEFRA um, spent uh, the last few years making sure that all the legislation and, um, and um, protection um, that was given through these EU directives was taken into the Environment Bill. And the Environment Bill um, is going through uh, uh, Parliament at the moment, and we were hoping it would have been done by now, but um, as you know, um, the government have been busy um, sorting something else out. So it's slightly um, delayed, but hopefully that will happen this year. So for the remedies projects, we're focusing on four um, Annex 1 habitats. And these are sandbanks, which are slightly covered by seawater all the time. So these are quite specific. Um, mud flats and sand flats not covered by seawater at low tide. Um, large shallow inlets and bays um, and estuaries. So one of the key, oh, sorry, failure. Um, so one of the key issues. So really we need a clean ocean. Um, our ocean provides over 50% of our oxygen. So um, that's the start off. Um, few people uh, don't know about these seabeds, uh, um, special features and location importance because we are dealing under the water. And unless you're lucky enough to dive or snorkel, um, then they're really out of view. Um, as Loveday said at the start, large areas of our seabeds within the SACs are currently under unfavourable condition. And that's a really real red flag to the EU. So um, governments have to work to move from unfavourable to favourable status. So within those Annex 1 habitats, and there are two sub uh, features which we're really focusing on, uh, mill and seagrass. And we've lost a uh, significant amount of our seagrass meadows. Um, this, a lot of that happened in the 1940s and the 50s um, where we lost over 90% of our seagrass meadows in the North Atlantic uh, due to a wasting disease which is like a, a nasty marine slime that smothered seagrass. So our numbers of seagrass meadows have already reduced so it's really important that we try and protect and um, conserve what we have. Another one is merle. Merle is this little uh, tiny uh, coralline algae which um, grows in little nodules, a bit like little coral. It's really sensitive and so if that is damaged it takes an awful long time to recover. So again we need to try and conserve that. And also recreational pressures. So the uh, number of people enjoying the seas or seas and oceans is increasing um, year on year, whether it be your um, stand-up paddleboard or your nice big expensive uh, uh, yacht. Um, and everyone wants to enjoy um, our seas um, um, and that's great. But with that increase in recreational pressure, it has the potential to um, increase the impacts on, our, um, on these sensitive habitats. So with that in mind, we came up with the uh, Life Recreation Remedies Project. Um, it's an acronym for reducing and mitigating erosion and disturbance impacts affecting the seabed. It's a four year project. Uh, we started in 2019 and um, we hope to complete in 2023. And we have three main objectives. So one is trying to reduce that recreational pressure on these habitats. And that's through um, a training program and also looking and trying to understand um, people's behaviours. So when they're out in the water and working with those communities to try and reduce or change or adapt their um, behaviours and um, for the benefit of these sensitive habitats. The second one is to restore and maintain. So we have a program to restore um, eight hectares of seagrass within Plymouth Sands and Estuaries and also the Solent Maritime. 
And then also looking at management techniques such as voluntary codes of conduct. And then of course, there's no point in doing all this work um, if people don't know about it. So we have a big um, awareness program, um, education program, and also we want to communicate our work um, to others and lessons learned across the UK um, and also Europe. So to do this, we have a number of partners. So the project is led by uh, Natural England. We have the Royal Yachting Association with the Green Blue Initiative, and they're a great connection to that recreational boating community. We have the Marine Conservation Society. Um, they've done some fantastic work conserving our seas. And within Remedies, they'll be working on education and also um, sea search. So the volunteer divers who are helping with our monitoring work. Ocean Conservation Trust, based at the National Marine Aquarium in Plymouth. They have a long-standing um, interest in seagrass, and so they'll be um, in charge of the restoration work and also education. We have Plymouth, Sound, uh, Plymouth City Council and Tamar Restory Consultation Forum, and, and they have um, a governance management role within Plymouth Sound and Estuary, so they'll be working there. And as I say, the funding came from the EU through the LIFE programme. So that provides 60% of our funding, and then the remaining 40% of match funding is met by our partners on their certain areas of work. So as you saw um, with the promotion of this webinar, um, and uh, Love Day has mentioned as well, we're working within these five areas, um, uh, SACs, and they are in Southern England. And the reason they were chosen is because we have uh, um, a great deal of data and information um, which shows that unfortunately some of these habitats are in unfavourable status. So through the work of remedies we want to um, try and move that unfavourable um, to favourable. Just for my final slide, this is a bit of a crazy map, but if you're um, really interested in these Annex 1 habitats and where they're located, um, and th this is um, Magic Maps produced by DEFRA. Um, it's open source, you can just go to it online. Um, it's a bit crazy to navigate. Um, you'll see there's a big um, key on the left hand side there, and you can look up um, where so many different designations are um, within the UK. Um, and you'll see here that I've just ticked uh, certain boxes for those Annex 1 habitats we're interested. So these are locations um, within the Fowl and Helford SAC. And you can see that there are two areas there, so the seagrass and mole, and both these photos were taken within the um, SAC. So the um, blue boxes, they're actually the locations for the seagrass, and then the um, darker orange boxes um, are locations for the mill, which you can see are many really focused um, outside of Falmer. As I say, this is quite a hard map to navigate. I just wanted to try and show you some of the locations, but within the work of remedies, what we want to do is to produce some simple charts and um, for those people that want to enjoy the waters and recreation, so they know um, where these habitats such as seagrass and mill are located and maybe um, try and avoid them if they can. So that's a, just a quick run through of um, SACs and the work of remedies. Um, and now we'll move um, further east and I'll pass you over to Tim to talk about Solent. Thank you. Thanks Fiona. Right then, let's see if I can just share my screen. It's going to be that one. And I need to do that. I think. So hopefully now you can all see my screen. So yeah, I'm Tim Ferreira, I work for Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust. And I've got a startlingly small amount of time to try and tell you a little bit about the Solent Maritime Special Area of Conservation. So let's have a look at it quickly on this map. I'd like you to ignore the bit here in blue, which is the South White Maritime SAC. We're actually looking at these areas on the north the coast of the Isle of Wight, the Hampshire coast, up Southampton Water, and the Solent Harbours of Langston and, and Chichester. And you've seen that it, these are designated for estuarine features and coastal features like intertidal sands and shallow subtidal sands and muds. And that's why we have this rather strange fragmented SAC, which is a bit difficult to appreciate. So instead, let's have a look at it in the real world. So here it is, this, this is the Solent, as you can see with its beautiful crystal clear 
blue waters, sunny days. Well, it was like that this morning anyway, it really was. Um, mostly it's a little bit more murky than that. But I think the important thing about this picture, which shows the entrance to Portsmouth Harbour, the SAC is to the right, to the left and behind me. This shows why we have SACs and why we have marine conservation, because this, this is us. We wouldn't be needing these areas if it wasn't for human impacts. And so we have in the Solent the combined impact of major conurbations, here's Portsmouth and Gosport. We have shipping, commercial, we have the Navy, we have commercial and recreational fishing, commercial and recreational sailing. There is so much activity and agricultural hinterland which uh, produces interesting agricultural runoff into our, into our rivers and then into our estuaries. So there is so much pressure, you can see how these combined pressures have an impact on the marine environment. And SACs give us the framework to try and do, try and do something about that. What I'd like to look at here is over on the right hand side, there's a rocky shore. We have rocky shores on the Isle of Wight. And although they're not specifically a feature of the SAC, it's important to remember all the way through that the things we do to manage and preserve and maintain our SACs have knock on effects throughout the system. So very important. But the main key habitats we're looking at are over on the left hand side. At the top, we have what you might call a micro rocky shore. So that's a real mixture of cobbles, pebbles, gravels, sand and mud. And an awful lot of this SAC is sediments like that in different proportions, sandy areas, pebbly areas, areas where it's a complete mixture. And particularly in the estuaries up Southampton Water and in the harbours and the Medina on the Isle of Wight, we have very muddy sediments. And so on the, on the bottom, you can see this estuarine mud flat in Portsmouth Harbour. And these sorts of mudflats are absolute biological powerhouses. They are food production machines, really. They're packed full of invertebrate life, worms, crustaceans, uh, mollusks. And all of this, all of this food production supports migratory birds over the winter, breeding birds in the summer. And when the tide's in, fantastic nursery areas for, for many fish species, many of which are commercially important. So these are the these are the fundamental sort of habitats of the SAC. But these habitats themselves support species which create new habitats as well. This is a European oyster over here on the left. And not so many years ago, only 10 years ago, the stone was still part of the home for a, a significant native oyster fishery, an oyster reef which is a fantastic habitat for promoting biodiversity, cleaning water, all the oysters are filtering water all the time. So within the SAC, there were large areas of oyster habitat. Unfortunately, that fishery has now collapsed. And at the moment, the oysters are in extremely low numbers. There, there are a few about, and there are efforts to restore them. So we can see that one type of habitat can actually promote another one. And we want to get those habitat features and habitat functions and services back. Of course, when you have a fishery like an oyster fishery or a shellfish fishery, you have to consider the fishing gear as well. And many of these fisheries use, oops, use, um, ah, go back, use gear which is dragged over the seabed and that in itself can be damaging and need to be managed. And this bottom image on the right shows an area of a particularly sensitive seagrass habitat over which an oyster dredge has, has dragged and caused quite a bit of damage. The time is short today so I really haven't got time to tell you all about our fantastic population of harbour seals or the thresher sharks that visit, visit the area during the summer probably as part of their breeding cycle or the, the simply amazing mantis shrimps that live in the muddier sediments in the Solent and in the SAC with their grasping claws and their incredible eyes the most complex visual system in the animal kingdom and I haven't got time either to tell you about the delicate warm water peacock's tail alga which is at its absolute northeastern limit on the Isle of Wight and when that jumps over to the Hampshire coast and goes up the channel we'll really know that climate change is happening. I can't really tell you about those. Instead I'm going to talk about whelks. This is a common whelk. 
it's a commonplace marine animal. And, and the importance of stopping to think about whelks is, again, there's this knock-on effect. When we look after an SAC, in legal terms, we're looking after a small number of habitats and species, features that are designated. But if we manage those well, we get knock-on effects right across the marine environment. Whelks used to be part of an important fishery in the Solent as well. Their numbers are a bit low at the moment, um, but they could be making a comeback. But really, it's, you know, it's the importance of the commonplace. Don't overlook it. If you're on the shore and you see a whelk, my advice is to get down, get right up close to it and just, just watch it charging towards you at full speed with the ground shaking. It, it's really a world class uh, wildlife experience and I recommend it to anybody. But finally, we do really do need to talk about our seagrasses. This is the key habitat really within the SAC, the key marine habitat and the key focus for remedies. And seagrasses are so important. They're the only marine higher plants, for example. And they're massively ecologically important for biodiversity because when seagrass grows across the seabed, it introduces structural complexity, which is great for diversity. It creates foraging and refuge habitats and nursery and spawning grounds, which supports so many species. Just as food, for example, we see a lovely Brent geese down at the bottom that feed on, on seagrass. The roots stabilize the sediment and the leaves themselves absorb wave energy so they actually help protect our coastlines. And together, those combination of roots and sediment stability and slowing down of water currents is really keen in the, in the role of seagrasses as carbon sinks. And they're extremely important. In fact, globally, although seagrass might be only 0.1 or 0.2 percent of the seabed, they account for about 11 percent of the carbon sink function. So really important. I showed you some dredge damage to seagrass earlier. An important aspect of the SAC is because of that legislation, the Southern Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority could introduce a bylaw which now bans all of that bottom dragging fishing gear across all of our seagrass beds. And that's a really important benefit which turns marine protected areas from paper parks on maps to real improvements in the marine environment. And so now Remedies is looking to do that with another impact from recreational boating. The Solent is really important hub for recreational boating. And we know that some activities, like traditional moorings and anchoring activities, can damage seagrass. And that, that damage, particularly if it damages the root net underneath in the sediment, it can be particularly long lasting. And it is important if we look in the Solent, all the seagrass we have in the Solent. So those scraps of green, it's amazing really, those represent a nationally and internationally important amount of seagrass. It's quite frightening really when you think about it. And we know that, you know, before the wasting disease back in the 30s, late 20s and 30s, there would have been about nine times more seagrass in the Solent. So this is a really important habitat to maintain and even to restore, regenerate and increase on. So just to finish off, I need to show you some seagrass. A couple of years ago, we were very lucky. We borrowed a mini ROV remote operated vehicle from the Natural History Museum and Southampton University. And we put it in a Solent seagrass bed. And this is what we recorded. Oops, this is what we recorded. You can see here the seagrass growing out of the seabed. There are some seeds in one of the leaves there. And the black stuff is the slime mold, the very same self same thing that caused the wasting disease. It's still there. We can see animals like this top shell using the leaves as habitat. Fantastic. It's a beautiful day, clear water, blue skies. And we know, for example, that both species of British seahorse are found in the Solent utilizing the seagrass. We've never caught one on camera. But on this day, we did manage to capture this pipefish. Absolutely beautiful. And using the seagrass in textbook fashion, foraging, using it for camouflage and safety. And so it's just a short clip. It's just a short window into what seagrass looks like in Solent and in the UK. Quite a magical place. And, and I really think it's worth us protecting. So that's about it.
if you want to find out a bit more about the Solent in general, we're working very closely at Hampshire United Wildlife Trust with the Remedies Project. And you can also Google Secrets of the Solent and find out a lot more about it there. I'm going to try and hand over to Gina now. Thanks very much. Hello. Hopefully if I share my screen, that's going to work. Okay, hopefully you can all see the presentation. So um, my name's Gina and I'm a lead advisor for the Essex Marine Team for Natural England. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a bit about the Essex Estuaries um, Special Area of Conservation and why it's so important. So, as you can see from this map, um, the Essex Estuaries SAC is quite large. Um, so it's that pink sort of hashed um, area here. And um, it is one of the, it is, it's actually the second largest estuarine site on the east coast of England. And um, it's a very good example of a coastal plain estuary system. Um, and it covers um, a very large area and four estuaries. So there's the uh, Colne estuary, which is up here. The Blackwater, which is this, oops. Right, go back, which is this one here, the crouch, which is here, and then the roach, which just comes off here. And there's seven designated features. Um, so we've got salt, salt marsh, uh, mud flats, and sand flats, um, salicornia, uh, sandbanks, which are covered by, by seawater all the time, and spartina swords. So, yeah. hello. Good. Interrupt. You're on your presentation view, so I think you need to. Ah, it's all a wee bit tiny. So, are you on the view with my notes and everything? Yeah, yeah, they're cracking notes. Ah, <laughs> it worked before. I wonder why that's not worked. <laughs> um, how, how should I stop sharing and see if I can? Yeah, get your other view figure out yeah, Gina don't don't worry just if you want to stop sharing um and uh just get it into into the, into the right view and then share again um while Gina's doing that just to remind you we've had a few questions pop up uh, which is really lovely to see thank you we'll get to those at the end um and, and, and pop those to our panel so you'll get answers uh, at the end um but do keep them coming pop your questions anything any thoughts anything you want to ask our panel i'll just pop that into the q a and uh, we will get to those at the end um but no panics gina don't worry <laughs> um, we'll be back with you <laughs> technical issues yeah okay i'm going to share again and see if you get the right view Okay, is that better? Can you see the, the presentation view now? Unfortunately not, we can still see your notes. I don't know if you can close your, your notes, Gina. Um, if you close those, that might uh, pop it up a bit bigger. Um, and then that, that grade box, if you could drag that out of the way, and then hopefully that's big enough for everyone can, to, to see. Uh, pop in the chat if it's not, but hopefully everyone can, can see that well enough uh, for us to, to continue. Uh, Gina, off you go. Sorry, is that all right? Is that view all right there? It's still on your on your notes view, but we can't see your notes, so the screen is a, a bit bigger, so we can see the picture. Okay, great. I'll carry on then from where I left off. Left off. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So I was talking about the designated features of the stack, um, and a lot of these sediments that are designated under the stack actually support um, a wide range of other species, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. And there's also many other overlapping designations. Um, so this map shows um, all of those, and it looks a bit of a mess because there's so many of them, but there's many um, other special protection areas, uh, marine con conservation zone, um, triple SIs, that are all overlapping with the Essex Estuaries SAC. 
and the sediments within the SAC support um, many of the species that are designated under these various other designations as well. So firstly, I'm going to talk about seagrass, as that's the uh, main remedies highlight. And um, seagrass is a subfeature of um, the Essex estuary sac. Uh, and you can see by these maps here that there's a large amount uh, of seagrass on the Essex estuary coast, mostly on the area between Maplin Sands, which is here, and Fowness Point, which is up here. And um, these seagrass beds are naturally important because they support many overwintering um, Brent geese, quite a significant number of the UK population of Brent geese, uh, and also habitat for juvenile fish and marine invertebrates. So they're, they're important for that reason as well. And also in terms of um, erosion, they help to reduce erosion events by binding the sediment. And the Recreation Remedies project, um, which we are working on uh, in partnership with um, many of our other partners and in Essex, particularly the Essex Wildlife Trust, we're looking to reduce these impacts, uh, recreational impacts to seagrass um, through education, um, monitoring and uh, engagement activities. And so this summer we hope to be gathering more data on the seagrass in Essex to see how it's doing now, what the extent is uh, and distribution to monitor um, for the baseline of the project. And then again, at the end of the project to see how well we've actually done in achieve, achieving reducing those recreational pressures. Next slide. So other sediments within the Essex estuaries sac also support uh, large numbers of native oysters. And um, native oyster beds are important because they support high bi a higher biodiversity of invertebrates and fish than other nearby areas. And they're a variable nursery habitat for fish as well. And they also improve water quality by reducing nitrogen levels levels which can often be high in estuaries and in Essex in particular um, they offer a cultural heritage value um, so native oyster fishing and cultivation have long been at the heart of the coastal communities in Essex and can be traced, traced back to Roman times and Anori which is the Essex native oyster restoration initiative uh, is a partnership which naturally is a part of and um, where it's a collaboration between oystermen, the government, conservationists, um, such as and um, organisations such as Natural England and the IFCA, and we aim to work towards towards Essex estuaries having a self-sustaining population of native oysters. So to do this, so far several things, uh, several good projects have gone on. So there's been the creation of a 200 hectare. Um, restoration box um, for the specific purpose of recovering native oyster beds within the estuaries. So within this box, mature native oysters are being translocated to improve reproductive success. And as well as this, the adoption of a fisheries management plan to recover native oysters populations um, within the estuaries uh, has been put, put forward. And a fisheries management plan and restoration box are projected under the native oyster permit bylaw. So next I'll talk about salt marsh a little bit. Um, so this map here shows these green areas are all areas of salt marsh around the Essex coast. Oops. And this picture here, which shows a large area of um, salt marsh, is in the Blackwater estuary, which is here. So Essex estuaries contains a significant portion of UK salt marsh res resource. Uh, and these areas are really important for um, overwintering birds, 
in which visit the estuaries every winter. And they also provide um, nutrients which support other features within the marine ecosystem, such as mudflats, sand flats, and subtidal areas. So yeah, as I said, um, the salt marsh that I just mentioned um, help, is supporting habitat for overwintering birds. And the Essex estuary supports tens of thousands of these birds every year. And the intertidal sediment, salt marsh and seagrass beds um, provide important feeding grounds. So for birds such as black-tailed godwit, which is pictured here, and red shank here, which are important species in, that visit the estuary, Accessory sack. So, Bird Aware Essex Coast is a part, another partnership which Nat Natural England are a part of, uh, and it's run by the Essex Coast Recreational Disturbance Avoidance Mitigation Partnership. That's a hard uh, line to say, or Essex Coast Rams. And the partnership's made up of twelve councils: the Essex County Council and Natural England. So. This partnership uh, aims to engage with visitors and communities along the coast to raise awareness of the birds that feed and breed on the Essex coast so that people can enjoy the coast and its wildlife without disturbing these birds. And in addition to overwintering birds, there's also many important breeding bird species. So I've just named a few of the species here and where they're most likely to be found in the Essex estuaries. Now, these birds uh, will nest on shingle beach habitats, but the mud flats and sand flats close to the coast, which are protected under the Essex estuary sack, are important feeding grounds for these nesting birds. So, for example, oyster catcher, so this little chick here. Oyster catchers will feed on cockles, mussels, worms, which are found in the mudflats. And ringed plover, which I don't actually have a picture of, uh, will feed on insects along the beach and crustaceans, uh, which are found within the mudflats. Mud so the Share Our Shores project, which is a project run by the Essex Wildlife Trust, which we're working with them as part of the, as part of the Remedies project as well. They aim to protect these beach nesting birds and want to create an ideal habitat and monitor the populations and work with the public to raise awareness. So there's three key sites that this project looks at, and that is the uh, Tolsbury Wick, Colm Point and Old Hall Marshes. So we're working closely with the Wildlife Trust to monitor recreational disturbance in these areas and other important remedies areas to deliver engagement for both of these projects to help reduce disturbance. And in addition to this, we've recently secured some funding um, and as part of um, a Blackwater Estuary Opportunity Mapping Project. So the work has been undertaken to take forward the Blackwater Partnership's collaborative nature recovery ambitions on the Essex coast. So what we hope to do is provide an accurate evidence base of the existing natural capital assets in the Blackwater Estuary and the surrounding catchment. We'll then work with the Blackwater partnership to take forward a collaborative exercise where we'll prioritise actions required for nature recovery and identify the most appropriate mechanisms to fund that change. So at the, at the moment this project's in phase one which is data gathering and then in phase two this will be put into an opportunity map and the main focus at the moment is the Blackwater area. But in the future, we hope to expand this to the Essex coast and feed into the ambitions of the Essex Climate Action Commission for the estuary. Thank you for listening.
Brilliant. Thanks so much, uh, Gina. Thanks to all our wonderful panelists, panelists today. Um, so, so amazing to hear about uh, not only the Remedies project there, Gina, but, but all those other amazing um, projects that are going on to, to help protect our seabed uh, and uh, make sure that everything uh, carries on as uh, as it should, uh, being being protected. Uh, so all of our panellists, if you wouldn't mind popping your cameras back on again, um, we do have some lovely questions uh, from our audience. Um, I should have said at the beginning as well, I, I forget to say this, but it's so important. Thank you so much for coming along on a Friday evening. Uh, it's really lovely that so many of you have, have, have shown up to, to listen to us on a Friday evening, uh, talk about things that we're really excited about. We think it's really cool and it's lovely to know that other people are interested too. Oh, it's just great. Uh, so thanks again to our panellists. I'm going to give some questions to you now. We've got quite a few really, really nice ones. Um, one of the first ones that came in actually when uh, Fee, when you were talking, when Fiona was talking about uh, our special areas of conservation, you mentioned the, the wasting disease. Um, is there a reason for the wasting disease? Is that, is, do we know why? Is that relate, pollution related? Uh, maybe you can give a bit of a, a background to that disease and, and why it's why it's there and why it's still there, as Tim, Tim mentioned. Um, I don't know if Tim wants to answer this. Um, uh, there's no real um, a reason. They can't really put a, um, their finger on it, um, according to the research, but... Um, but pollution, um, runoff, fertilizers, and herb herbicides have certainly been um, um, highlighted as encouraging the growth of um, the wasting disease and the um, expansion of it. And I think I'd probably say 40s and 50s, but actually in the 30s, it only took a couple of years to uh, have that devastating effect. And I suppose I should say that, um, you know, the sort of water quality. Um, and, you know, there are other impacts on seagrass and such as water quality with um, what happened with the wasting disease. Um, and so um, we're very aware of that and we're just sort of looking at recreation. But it's really important as we look at um, conserving the seagrass that statistically and there's a lot of work that has been done um, to improve our water quality. And as Tim says, that. Um, that little slimy dude um, is still hanging around, but thankfully um, it's not having such an impact. I don't know if Tim's got something to add to that. I, th I think, um, I mean, yes, it, when, when it first started in the 30s, it was just known as the wasting disease. It wasn't really understood what it was. Um, however, there was a further outbreak, particularly in the, in the 80s. And at that point, this, this slime mould thing called Labyrinthula zosteri was, was isolated and identified. Um, and it, it does persist in the population. There's, there is some evidence that it may be not quite as virulent as, as it was. I mean, there could be some real-time evolutional resistance in populations building up, but it, it is certainly still there. You can see it very clearly um, in, in a lot of the seagrass that, that we look at. Fantastic. Uh, thanks to both of you. I hope that answers that question. That was really good. Um, we had a, another question when we were talking um, about the special areas of conservation. And again, Fee, I think uh, this was what this one's aimed at you. Um, should the areas be marked with buoys? Should these special areas of conservation be marked out so uh, that water users and, and other people know where they are? Um, I, I just, that wouldn't be practically be possible um, to mark out these areas. I mean, as I say, we, um, we have the, um, those maps where you can see the different areas, but um, as Tim was saying as well, you know, they're, they're designated for, um, very specific habitat, so um, certain areas, not necessarily for a wide area. So it would be um, difficult to um, to put buoys out. I think you'd have a plethora of buoys um, all over the sea, which would probably create a nasty um, navigation hazard. So, um, so it's important that we make people aware of um, them. And as I say, through remedies with the charts and maps. So, um, so yeah, I, I personally don't think it'd be um, practical but I, I I get I get the question <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's nice to think we could mark them all out but the ocean is a it's a bit different to terrestrial habitats isn't it it's hard to hard to mark them out um but yeah no yeah, good question 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't fence it off. Um, so we did have another question here. I don't, I, I'll throw this one open. Anyone, anyone can answer this one. I think. Um, how will the funding be affected by Brexit? I think that's probably a general question for all EU funded projects at the moment. How is that going to be affected uh, by Brexit? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> Uh, well, it has been affected by Brexit, yeah, unfortunately. Um, so many fantastic projects um, have been funded um, through the EU um, and every member state pays into um, the European Union to support these um, this funding and um, the UK have paid into a lot of these um, projects like um, the EU programme, EU Life programme for a number of years and so and um, we have been out, able to access it, but actually this year was the last round to access um, to life and other programs. So um, we just hope, uh, and I think there is, you know, some agreement from government that um, we will just have to um, look um, internally um, to be able to get that support um, and that we won't now receive from, um, from life or any other EU funding, she says. <laughs> Try not to cry. Yeah, so uh, not a positive answer to that question, but uh, the truth, unfortunately, that's uh, that's the way we we've gone. Yeah. Oh dear. Um, so yeah, another question, slightly more light-hearted one. Uh, this one's for you, Gina. <laughs> um, this one uh, is: Are the Brent geese seasonal visitors, or are they actually in in Essex year-round? Do they do they come and go? Uh, yeah, so they they overwinter in the estuary, so. From November is the most important time in Essex where we get um, the largest numbers of Brent geese. Um, but it tends to be sort of November to March time um, is the overwintering period. Cool, great. And, and another question about the geese. The geese are popular. Uh, do these geese or wildfowl, wildfowl, not wildflowers, uh, wildfowl eat the seagrass at all? Is that, is that food for them? Yeah, so they feed in, in the seagrass, yeah. Yeah, on, on the seagrass itself or just on, on little gribblies they find in there? Uh, sort of on algae and stuff that's on the roots of the seagrass. Um, yeah. Cool, that's great. Brilliant. Um, we also had another animal related question and I love this one. Uh, it's for you, Tim. Uh, someone wants to know what the long part of the whelk was called. Ah, yes. Fantastic. Well, that, that's the thing that's sticking up like that off the whelk's head. That's actually, it's called its proboscis which is um, an extraordinary organ. It's what the whelk uses to, to eat with and, and it also smells with it. So whelks are amazing. They can, they can smell something to eat from 20 to 30 metres away with, and then take 24 hours to charge towards it. And then they use their, their proboscis to actually um, drill holes or punch into, into food sources and, and suck out the contents. Yeah, so it's, a, it's their feeding device, really. Cool, great little creatures, amazing, fantastic. Um, we had, uh, here we go, uh, this is a really good one. Um, and again, anyone can jump in here, so it's going to be first to answer. Uh, how deep uh, will seagrasses survive and how do carbon emissions affect them? I guess, well, in, in, in the Solent, where we do have slightly murky water most of the time, then in the Solent, seagrass doesn't really get much deeper than about two to five metres below chart datum. So it's like the lowest tides that you can get. Um, but I think it does, it does grow a lot deeper in much clearer waters. I think it can get down as far as about, about 20 metres in, in some situations. Um, as, as for carbon emissions, I, I, I guess that I mean, carbon dioxide is food for plants, if you like, on one on one level. So they are they are absorbing carbon dioxide when they photosynthesize. Um, but I think it's all it's all the side effects. It's it's the ocean acidification and other aspects of of climate change and global warming that are potentially more damaging to uh, to sea grasses because they, they affect their physiology much more. But we we certainly know that seagrass meadows are very important as carbon dioxide sinks as carbon sinks burying carbon down in the sediment 
Brilliant, fantastic. And I know you mentioned earlier, Tim, about uh, certain species moving further north as uh, as as the climate changes as well. So I guess that's a that's an impact as well, isn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, lots of things are on the move, really. Yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one one more question. Uh, we've got a couple just come in last minute here uh, before we wrap up and, and let everyone get to their their Friday evenings. Um, I think this one's for you, for you Fiona. Um, what would you uh, consider to be a successful outcome of our lovely remedies project? Uh, is it sort of percentage of restored seagrass, uh, reduced rate of decline, expansion? What what's what's a successful outcome of the project? Uh, successful outcome. Well, hopefully, uh, when we get out of COVID, we'll be able to do a lot more. So that would be one big success at the moment. Um, but it will be, so we have uh, the plan to um, restore eight hectares. It's very much a trial to um, to test large scale restoration. So um, the success, if we can, um, if that's successful, then um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be going out celebrating that. But I think also um, it will be harder to monitor than uh, the restoration is just that sort of change of attitudes. and. And more people um, being aware and understanding of the importance of these habitats um, and wanting to protect it. And so you kind of look at um, behaviour change and people's um, change in attitudes. And I think um, you know, it'd be great success if we start seeing, seeing maybe recreational boaters trying to uh, avoid um, uh, seagrass areas or if they can't, then um, using more environmentally um, sensitive ways to anchor um, uh, to uh, try and avoid that damage and then also we're trying to um, install advanced mooring systems um, so they're getting away from these uh, traditional moorings that have a big riser chain that scours out the seabed um, again that's very much a trial and I think if um, people really um, see the success of those and adopt them then um, then I'll be a very um, happy project manager. So there's lots of asset, lots of aspects of the work we're doing. I mean, some things to trial. I'm sure um, we won't win on everything, but um, I think people's changing attitudes and an increase in awareness about habitats would be a be a good bonus. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Something we all want to see. And uh, as you say, we just need to get out of COVID and then we can uh, we can move forward yeah. more quickly. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, massive thank you again to our wonderful panellists. Thank you so much uh, for giving up your time on a Friday to come and talk to us about something you're passionate about. It's really great uh, to, to, for, all, for all the wonderful people who've shown up to see, see your passion and what, what you do. Um, and thank you to everyone who's turned up to to listen uh, to those wonderful talks. Um, as you can hopefully see on your, your screen there, um, we have some contact information. Uh, so if you didn't get your question answered or if there's something you'd like to, to ask us uh, a bit more privately um, or anything you just wanted to add to our conversation, please do get in touch on that email address uh, and also follow us uh, with loads, loads of stuff going out on, on social media all the time about what we're getting up to. Uh, so there's your, your tags and your hashes and all of the, the associated things you need to do that uh, so uh, this is also being recorded uh, so if you know someone who'd be interested uh, keep a lookout on social media we will be posting a recording uh, to this webinar so you guys can look back through to your heart's content or share it with anyone who didn't manage to come along today uh, thank you so much again uh, and we'll see you for the next episode keep a lookout for that uh, that's coming at the end of march uh, so thank you again enjoy the rest of your evenings and see you later goodbye